Welcome. Uh, this is um, exciting for me. I love interviewing super smart technical people, whether they are customers or, in this case, um, engineers within the team. Uh, my name is Claire Giordano. I work at Citus Data, and I am in California right now, about a mile from Stanford University in Northern California. And I'm going to be talking to Marco Slot who um, is based in the Netherlands. So I'll introduce Marco in just a minute. Um, this uh, interview, uh, we've scheduled it for the full hour. There'll be some time for Q&A at the end. And I wanna quickly cover a couple of logistics. Um, at the bottom of your screens, you should be seeing um, slides that I'm projecting right now. Like right now, you should be seeing the cover slide. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a panel if you mouse down there, and you'll see a Q&A box. You'll also see a raise hand box. Um, so uh, we will be taking questions at the end rather than interspersing in the middle, but you can drop your questions into the Q&A box at any point along the way. Uh, we're not planning on using the chat facility, so just if you could focus your attention on Q&A, that would be great, and we'll get to those, um, as many of them as we can at the very end. So logistics out of the way, I want to introduce Marco Slat. So Marco has a PhD in distributed systems, which is kind of why he works at a distributed database company. Um, he's based in the Netherlands, um, and he is an ex-Amazon engineer, as are many people. Um, he is a principal and a lead engineer at Citus, and I don't know why you put chocolate chip cookies on there, Marco, but um, say hello to everybody, please. Hey everyone, I just really like chocolate chip cookies and talking about distributed databases. So excited to be here. Awesome. So, so the whole reason we decided to have this interview, um, it all starts from this, a lightning talk that you gave earlier this year at PG Day Paris, which is a one day Postgres community event. Um, and this, I, I hope, I hope you like this picture. I screenshotted it from the YouTube video. Um, and if people are interested later, the, the URL link is at the bottom of this um, screenshot right now. Um, but I don't think it really starts there. I think the story starts here, right, Marco? Right, right. Well, I, uh, so this PG Day Paris is a really nice conference. Um, and I went there by train in the morning. Um, and I kind of felt like doing a lightning talk, so I was preparing it on the train. And I wanted to do something a little crazy and built this, as the title said, distributed geospatial time series database. And I, um, I was kind of thinking, well, how do I go about doing that? And uh, the answer actually came quite quickly. It was Postgres extensions. Um, and especially combining a couple of Postgres extensions, you can very quickly uh, put together a very advanced uh, database that optimizes for specific use cases on top of Postgres. Well, that's one of the things I really liked when I was watching your PG Day Paris video um, in preparation for this interview. You started off the presentation with this quote, which I just had to write down, that one of your favorite things about Postgres is its extensibility, that you can just add new features to the database without actually having to change it. And I actually think the extension APIs are one of the smartest things the Postgres community could have ever created because it's, it's opening up the doors to all sorts of interesting innovation. Um, so, but uh, there are people on this call today probably who don't know, so I'm gonna ask you this, and I'm just gonna type in questions when I ask them just so people can kind of see it as well as hear it. So let's talk to me about what exactly is a Postgres extension. Uh, so a, a Postgres extension is like a plugin, like uh, you have browser plugins that add a feature to your browser or change the way it works a tiny bit. And Postgres has the same uh, for the database. So uh, there's many places in Postgres where it allows an extension to change something or add something. It can be as simple as some functions or some, some new types. But it goes really deep. An extension can uh, set, change the way the query planner works. And it can also store metadata in, inside the database. And the combination of these things lets you do really powerful things. Like you can say, hey, this, this particular table, when you query it, let this extension handle the query. And we'll, we'll do something different than we do for all the other tables. And I mean, that's really what allows you to then start optimizing for different workloads within one database. You could even even mix and match like 
put di multiple different workloads on, diff on the same database and then use an extension to kind of optimize the way the storage works. Um, and I mean, one particular area which is uh, getting a lot of attention where that's very relevant is, is uh, time series. Okay. Nice Postgres for time series. Okay, so that, of course, a lot of people who join this call probably work with time series data every day. And they, they live it, they breathe it, they eat it, but it's, it's what they do. But there might be a few people on the call, too, who are not yet working with time series data in their day-to-day -day work. So um, just let's cover the basics. What is time series data? And, and in particular, what does it look like? Um, well, it's, it's very simple. It's essentially just uh, t tends to be a log of records, right? It comes from uh, you measure something and you, you kind of write down the time and the measurement. So you, and, sent me, you sent me this to show. Right, right. So this is kind of in its most primitive form, uh, time series data. There's, there's a timestamp and we measured some things. Uh, it doesn't, in this case, really matter what. Sometimes, um, like the data structures are a bit more complicated, and we have this whole JSON object with like uh, a couple of different variables inside of it uh, that that represents a measurement at a particular time. Uh, and this can be uh, specific events. It can also be something that happens periodically, like every minute or even every second. Um, but this is the raw data. This is just what kind of the data looks like when it's generated. Maybe when it's first put into the database, but it's, a, it's not a very consumable form. So when people interact with time series, it usually looks something more like this, where um, there's, there's some visualization, that typically a dashboard with graphs where you can see, oh, now I can see the pattern of day and night. This actually uh, shows you, uh, it's a taxi ride data set. So you can see, well, at night, there's very few taxi rides happening, but at, at, during, what is it, eight o'clock at night, there's a lot happening. Um, and, and this is very common for many time series data sets that you try to visualize them like this and then it's often useful to also overlay a couple of them to uh, kind of see patterns between different uh, measurements. Okay, so this, this, is, this is Grafana, right? Right, right. Okay. Yeah, so Grafana is a, is a really neat tool to, uh, to build dashboards. Uh, so if you, if you have a database that contains uh, time series data, it can connect to various different databases and also Postgres. And uh, you can just very easily create a graph that generates a, and then generates a SQL query using the time filters that you have in the dashboard and sends it to the database. And then it gets it back and turns it into a graph. It's a, it's a really neat tool. Okay, so just another framing question to get us all on the same page. Um, why, why are we talking about time series data right now? Why is it so special? Well, it's, it's, it's been a bit of a hot topic where, um, I mean, time series data isn't something new, you know, it's just ultimately it's record keeping. But I think uh, what's driving a lot of interest in it um, is just computer systems that, are very, that operate at a very large scale and also are getting quite complex with lots of different components or, you know, when you deploy an app or, or, or a website application that usually involves many different systems deployed alongside each other. And to actually keep them all running and keep your customers happy, you actually need to monitor those systems. And um, so there's a lot of tools that let you kind of gather data about these systems, both on in terms of like hardware utilization, things going wrong, failures, but also more application specific uh, metrics that you want to get gather into one place and then kind of visualize such that the operators know, know if everything is good and can analyze um, kind of current trends that are, are happening in your system. And I, I think this also expanded in is or is rapidly expanding into or the hardware space where it's more about keeping track of devices, cars, machinery, um, and you know everyone knows these these buttons where, where you can say whether you're happy or not at the airport. Um, and and often it's all about uh, improving a process. So if you think of those buttons, like it allows operators to see, oh, some people are very unhappy in a particular area. We should go check that out immediately and make it better. And you can also spot trends over time. If you change something about the way you run the airport, uh, it, it'll get better. And this applies to kind of all these systems. The, basically by measuring things, it'll get better. That's the, the gist of it. Got it.
Okay. So you work for a database company. Um, you're a huge fan of Postgres. Um, so I got to ask you something about how time series data connects into the database space. So I guess what are the, what are the challenges, right? For databases when it comes to handling time series data. Right. Um, so uh, I think the, the challenge is always volume. Um, when you have a tiny bit of data, you know, everything is kind of easy. But when you're dealing with large volume and also maybe diff many different sources of data and having to process those, um, like actually in a database, there are specific issues that you start running into, um, especially in traditional databases. And uh, so one of the challenges is just the size, it keeps growing, it keeps growing. And then, um, but you also have these query, you wanna do queries on it, which maybe go across all the data or, or some maybe only on the recent data, but uh, there's, a, there's a pretty high concurrency in terms of writes coming in constantly and reads coming in constantly of people maybe looking at a dashboard. Uh, and, and those reads need to process maybe hundreds or millions of rows. Um, so those, that's some of the challenges. Um, and there are specific storage challenges around time series data. Um, particularly, if you think of just storing it on disk, like a traditional SQL, like MySQL would uh, typically stores the data ordered by primary key. Now you can still have a primary key in a time series database, but um, it, it'll essentially the data will end up going all over the place. Like because your, your time series, your primary key cannot be the timestamp um, because you know, there might be many events with the same timestamp. Uh, so it, it's quite hard for such a database to efficiently uh, store the events and support high write throughput. And then there's other things that need to happen. Like we may need to delete all data. And so suddenly we're saying, you know, 10% of our current data set, let's, let's delete it because you know, it's, it's been a month. You said delete old data. You didn't say delete all data, right? Old. No, no. O L D. <laughs> don't don't delete all data. You want to delete. Uh, I usually the, the thing is because the volumes are so large, you often cannot afford to just keep everything. So maybe after a month, and sometimes already after a few days, you want to delete it from the database. But you also had these queries that you wanted to make fast. So to make those queries fast, you often have some indexes. But then if you delete a big chunk of your table, all those indexes need to get updated. And that becomes an extremely expensive operation. And also because those indexes across all the data get really big, writing gets slower and slower as your data grows. So it's really this, this, this mountain of data that is, becomes kind of hard to handle unless you have a database that kind of optimized specifically for that. Okay. All right, so um, I know, because I talked to you before the call, that you did pull together a really sweet demo that we're gonna go into in a few minutes, but I have a few more kind of framing questions that I really have to get out of the way. And um, the next thing I wanna know is, so you talked about the database challenges. Um, are all databases good with time series data? Does it, does it matter? Like, is there something to think about here or something to consider? Um, yeah, I don't think all databases are good with it. Um, uh, basically, you, you want a few things. Um, I mean, you want a way for, for writes to be fast. You want a way to make your queries fast. Uh, you want to make sure that things are always updated in real time. And you want a way to expire old data. And yeah, as I said, that puts a lot of requirements on the storage format. Um, like some, uh, for example, MySQL wouldn't be uh, a great way to do that because its storage format is more optimized for kind of having a, uh, a table with keys and where, with primary keys where you can do lookups and update on a key and delete on a key. And, and actually similar story for NoSQL databases. Um, like the advantage would, for, of a NoSQL database would be it has to scale. Uh, like if your data keeps growing, well, you can add more nodes and you can keep the data in memory. But um, the way the data is divided over, um, over all the nodes is based on a particular key. And that doesn't work very well with time series data. Also doing large queries and large deletes often doesn't work that well. Um, so I do think Postgres is, uh, is actually quite suitable for it. Not, not maybe vanilla Postgres, but when, when we take Postgres and then add some extensions, then we can actually get all those uh, requirements fulfilled. 
Well, so I grabbed this slide um, from, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know, Sai gave a talk at PyCon Canada a couple of days ago over the weekend up in Toronto. And um, this was a slide in his talk. And, and it's actually based on a conversation he had with me when he was preparing me to go to Lisbon um, for PGConf EU. And he was telling me all the things he loves about Postgres from starting with the fact that it's open source and going on from there. Um, but in terms of handling time series data, like what, where, where do you want to focus our attention? Like what is it about Postgres that makes it particularly good at handling time series data? Um, there's a few things. One is, so the Postgres storage format is actually a bit less, less organized in a way. It's a, it's a heap of data, but that has a very particular benefit. And that is that if you write to the database, you're all, you can just append it to the end of, of a file essentially. And that allows you to do very high throughput uh, bulk loading. There's this, the copy command in Postgres, which can do like millions of, of rows per second if you need to, or maybe on a single node, hundreds of thousands of rows per second. Um, and then there, there are particular index types that um, help you deal with time series data, such as the Brin index type. And also a lot of the time you're actually, uh, you, you have to deal with JSON or something like unstructured data or semi-structured data rather. Um, and then Postgres has the JSONB data type, but more importantly, it can also put any type of index on top of the JSONB. And so this will help you uh, make particular queries really fast. Um, and there's also other um, kind of features such as HLL and top end that make, let you do specific types of analytics on it. So it, it has a, a good set of features. But what, perhaps the most important one is that you can actually, you know, you can use extensions to uh, kind of optimize very specifically for time series. Cool. So then you sent me a table. Is this when you want me to put it up or was I supposed to, do you want to put it up later? You sent me a table with examples of different Postgres extensions. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Here it is. So, hmm. Yeah, so there's there's quite a few of these, um, and uh, I mean we we wrote some of the, these extensions, uh, but there 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 are more and more really useful extensions. Uh, PostGIS is quite well known for um, providing functions for um, geospatial data, so you can query like, is this give me the rows that are in a per whose whose location match a particular area and and those kind of things, and and actually you can do very, very advanced queries that way. Um, but the ones I, I kind of like to zoom into uh, right now would be PG Partman and Citus because they combine in a very interesting way. Okay. All right. So PG Partman, um, some people here probably use it already, but there's, there might be other people who've never heard of it. So I grabbed this screenshot from the readme.md kind of scrolling down the PG Partman Git page. Um, but um, can you give us a quick executive summary about what it is? Yeah, so PG Partman is a tool, uh, as it says, for partition management. So Postgres uh, has some low-level APIs for creating partitioned tables. Um, and PG Partman is a way to automate the process of creating partitions and dropping old partitions and creating new partitions. Um, it basically makes it very usable. So uh, with PG Partman, you can say, well, this, this table is uh, a partition. I want this to be a partition table. So you give it a table name. And then it goes and creates partitions. You can say, like, create partitions from, I don't know, start of 2017 until maybe a few months in, or a few hours into the future, uh, depending on which time period you pick. You can actually pick the time period yourself. Can and I pause you? Can I yeah. pause you? Create underscore parent. That's how you create a partition. Yeah, yeah. So it's okay. a function that you run from a query, uh, okay. and it basically says, "Well, this this table is going to be the parent table of all the partitions." Okay. And yeah, once you've done that, the advantage is that um, you're the because you've divided the data into small partitions, and each partition typically represents a time range. Um, the each, the each t each of those partitions also has its own indexes, and by doing that, you avoid the problem where if you're trying to index the full data set, like the indexes become really big and your writes become slow and some of your queries become slow. But by partitioning the data, and I'm always writing to the most recent partition, all my writes go through a relatively small index. 
also because the database knows where uh, data for a particular time range is that if you do a query where you only select like the last two days, it knows which partition it needs to query. So those queries become much faster. And also very importantly, I don't need to do these big complex delete operations where I have to rebuild all my indexes, but rather I can just say, oh, take this alt partition and just, just remove it from the table. So this kind of fits, uh, fits the requirements for that I need for uh, kind of handling uh, time series data on a single node. Now the problem is at some point uh, time series data tends to grow not just in terms of like okay if I keep it and it keep, keeps getting bigger but also the volume at, per month let's say keeps growing usually keeps growing in many applications. So if I want to be able to deal with that I also need to uh, scale across multiple nodes. And that's where the Citus extension comes in. Okay, so I grabbed a copy of our Git repo page for Citus um, and put it on here. Um, and, and one of the reasons I like to show this in my presentations is because it really drives home the point that Citus is open source. Um, we also have enterprise software that people can you know, purchase, get support, run anywhere. Um, and we have our database as a service that we manage. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people who use open source today in production and are really happy with it. And I think it's a really super valuable way for people to try it out and kick the tires as well, even if they intend on being a you know, cloud database customer eventually. So this is our Git repo page. I circled the number of stars, Marco, because I am on a mission to, to get us to 3,100 stars by the end of the month. So sorry, sorry for that plug. But um, I will let you, um, Let's see, I go from here. And I think, I think you had another chart that I want to get to, which is right here about Citus. Okay, talk right. to us, explain it. Um, so the idea with Citus is that you can shard, and, and shard is actually distributed systems speak for partitioning, uh, partition a table across many servers. And here you usually pick some identifier, maybe if you have a data, uh, if your application has a lot of different users, it's very common to uh, shard by the user ID or the tenant type. And the way you create this uh, charted or rather distributed table is to run this create distributed table function. So very similar to what we did before when we said create parent, now we say create distributed table. And essentially that, that changes uh, Postgres into a distributed database. Now, whenever I query that table, the, the work will actually be spread out across uh, many Postgres nodes. So before I get started with Citus, I need to specify which, which Postgres nodes I have in my cluster. If you use a managed service, that, that happens automatically. Um, and like when you do the create distributed table, it will connect to those nodes and create shards. And the shards themselves are just regular Postgres tables as well. So these, these green boxes in the diagram, those are meant to depict shards, right? Yes, yes. Okay. And so when I connect to a Citus cluster and for example, I copy into the distributed table, actually that copy gets fanned out across the shards. And uh, this actually in part parallelizes the data ingestion so I can get really high uh, ingest rates up to many millions of rows per second. But also when I query a distributed table, uh, that query will also be parallelized across the shards by the Citus query planner will figure out which SQL query it can run in each of the shards in parallel and then, and then combine the results. Or if it knows that it can go to a single shard, it'll just send it over there. Um, but also very importantly, you cannot just do regular like reads and writes. You can also do transformations of the data inside the database in parallel. So, uh, which could be using an update or a delete command, but also what we very often see is users having insert select. So you insert into one table and select from another table. And this is very useful for building uh, roll-up tables where you insert into a roll-up table that contains pre-aggregated data, and then you select from a raw data table. So you can just essentially write your raw data into the database and process it there and prepare it for your application. And because uh, you can do this across nodes and you can easily add more nodes and uh, Citus can move the shards around to the new nodes without any kind of downtime, you can make sure that even as your data set and your data volume uh, grow, you always have enough memory to keep it in memory if that's a goal or you always have enough CPU to make your queries fast enough and you always have enough storage and IO throughput. 
Okay. So we know any of us who've watched your PG Day Paris lightning talk video, and we know from the introduction that, that the thing that you find so powerful about Postgres is you can use Postgres and PG Partman and Citus, which is why you sent me this third diagram, correct? Right, right. So, um, yeah, what's, it becomes really cool when, um, like, all of the, once you add an extension to Postgres, it, it com often combines quite nicely with not just all the existing Postgres features, including indexes and, and data types, but also with other extensions. And this is an example uh, with PG Partman, um, where PG Partman can take care of partitioning a table on a node, and Citus can take care of sharding it across nodes. And you can actually do both together uh, because the way PG Partman is implemented, it's very uh, light touch. It just does DDL commands and then Citus gets those DDL commands and executes them in a distributed way. And the, the net result of that is that you get, you can have tables that are sharded across nodes uh, for parallelism and then also partitioned by time, which gives us the nice properties that we need for dealing with large volume time series data, both expiring data, querying the recent data, and, and just writing it at, uh, into a large table. Okay, so that's the drum roll. This is all leading up to me asking you the question of, can you show me how it actually works? Right, you've, you've explained it, but I'd love to see it. Right, right. So I'm gonna uh, show you a little demo. Uh, so I'll steal the screen from you if I can do that. Um, can you do that? Do you need me to stop? No, I think I have it. Awesome. Right. Okay, so uh, this is my screen now. And I set up a Citus cluster and I, uh, so I, and to connect to a Citus cluster, I just use regular psql. So I mean, Citus is just a Postgres extension. It doesn't have any, any, any tool that can connect to Postgres can connect to Citus. And uh, I loaded a data set that is uh, kind of a popular sort of time series example data set. It's the New York City cab rides. Um, there's a nice GitHub repo, which makes it suitable for uh, for Postgres or which has some tools which automatically loads the data into Postgres. So I just use those. Um, and there's one table in particular here, which is the raw data table um, called trips, which contains all the trips and I've loaded them since the start of 2017. And you can see here that there's not one trips table, but there's actually uh, many uh, smaller tables which each contain one month of data. So these are the partitions that were created by uh, PG Partman. So earlier I ran this command like create parent with the table name and I also specified the time column I wanna use. I wanna say I wanna use Postgres 10's own partitioning or, or Postgres native partitioning. Um, I say I want, said I want a monthly partition and I wanna start from the 2017. And so then it, when I ran that command, it create, went and created all these partitions for me. Uh, this is an extra feature. It's, it's mostly for, uh, for creating indexes. So basically it, it'll take all the indexes from this table and apply them to all the partitions. So that's how I can <laughs> have indexes on my partition table. Okay, and can I ask you a question? Um, mm -hmm. I, I got slightly distracted for a second because I don't know if you noticed that little red thing popping up on the bottom of my screen. So I had to go kill this application. Um, while I was doing that, did you mention that this is all running on a, a cluster? Um, a no, not yet. Cluster? So, well, I said it, but let me show you. Okay. Um, so basically my cluster actually has eight other uh, Postgres nodes. So I'm connected to one of them, one node, and it has the distributed table. And these eight nodes are the ones that actually store the data. So the other command I ran was uh, earlier was create distributed table. And that goes and connects to all these nodes and creates the shards. And when I run a query on this uh, table, like a select count stars, it's pretty simple. Um, you can see uh, it contains currently around 180 million rows. And here's something cool is already happening with where, um, so to do a count star, Postgres actually has to go through all the data and, and scan it. But Citus can do that in under a second. It's doing around 200 million rows per second here. Uh, and that's because it parallelizes it across my whole cluster, which has uh, in total around 64 
cores or V CPUs as they're called on EC2. Uh, I think it has around 488 gigabytes of memory in total. And uh, if I do like an explain here, I can see that um, the actual query is being handled by Citus and it goes to the node and then the node scans all the partitions, but there's actually also does that in parallel. So Citus is actually parallelizing it across 32 uh, cores and, but then there's, or 32 into 32 tasks, but then it's also getting parallelized on the nodes themselves. Okay, so this, this cluster that you just described, eight nodes, 64 V CPUs, 488 gig RAM total, not per node, but total across all eight nodes. Is that like the maximum size Citus database cluster that people use? Or is it just what you happen to pick? No, there is, there is basically no maximum size on a Citus cluster. I can just keep adding more nodes. I can also, of course, use much bigger nodes and use many of them. And um, yeah, there's, uh, there's many Citus clusters with dozens of nodes. Okay. So um, it's and just... I can actually just keep adding them and then uh, basically rebalance the data. Okay. So it's just what you happen to pick for the purpose of this demo. Cool. Yes. Got it. Um, so, well, my raw data is in this um, trips table and it's not in a sort of nicely consumable form. So what I did was um, I set up uh, a little Grafana dashboard where um, basically it's, I, I only started playing with Grafana quite recently, but it's, I, I really like it. I and, love Grafana. I'm so happy you're using it for this demo. And what you can see here is that uh, it's currently showing a uh, visualization of about uh, one month of data that represents about 10 million rows. Um, and it's actually each of these graphs, uh, it's the, the, the SQL query behind it scan, actually scans through 10 million rows. So every time I uh, change like the time range, the database in the background is scanning through 10 million rows. So even though the, the data is quite large, um, and, you know, I can make it more extreme and go to uh, a full year of data, uh, it takes a few, but it still only takes a few seconds to, to actually render that. Um, so this is, this is very useful, but it's not necessarily uh, the smartest thing I can do because it, it is quite resource intensive. So uh, a thing we see users do very often is uh, create these roll-up tables. So I can, uh, I made a roll-up table called hourly trips by borrow. And, um, oh, uh, that's not the query I wanted. So you can see um, the data here is summarized. Um, so basically it says for this particular hour and this particular cab type, and basically it, there's data for yellow and green cabs, and I think two is the green cabs. Uh, for, there were 875 rides from Manhattan. Um, and then the yellow cabs had, of course, way more. Um, so I can actually use this data to do much faster queries because the summarized data is, I can scan through it much quicker. But uh, first, let me show you how this data actually, I can actually create this table inside the database. So I'll, uh, I'll delete some of the rows that are already there. Um, and maybe I can actually skip ahead a bit and, and show you the dashboard uh, over here. So this dashboard uses the rollup table. So you can see I now am missing, I, this is the data I just deleted. And the way I construct uh, a rollup table is just by doing an insert into select. So I will insert into my rollup table. Um, here I'm doing some, some joins, you know, I can do whatever I want in here, it's SQL. So this is just to figure out which, which uh, part of New York uh, the taxi ride is in and or it starts from. And then I, I group by hour and type and the borrow name. And uh, I, want, I, <laughs> I want to do this from uh, the start of 2018. And usually you do this basically, I mean, you can do this on a minute schedule, right? As data comes new in, every minute you run this, you have a background job that runs this command, for example. Now, if I run this command, it actually processes around 60 million rows and it does it in about three and a half seconds. So that's a lot of rows per second. And um, I, can, I can verify that because, uh, let me see. So I could count the number of trips from uh, from the start of uh, 2018, but remember, it's actually also joining 60 million rows against these these other tables. 
but actually I can now also do something smarter, which is because I've summarized the data already, I can do uh, a sum on my aggregates and I can use that to get the count for this particular time range. And you can see that this is already much faster because now I'm not looking at the raw data, I'm looking at a much smaller summary table. So it, it got more than 10 times faster by doing this. And so I can use that in my dashboard as well, where uh, now, you know, the data is filled in again. And in this dashboard, you know, it's almost everything I do is almost instant. And, but I get the exact same results I got before. Uh, the difference is now it's actually, I mean, I'm showing the number of rows that are scanned by each queries. And here I'm scanning like a few thousand rows, which is uh, not so much. Even if I look at the full data, uh, it goes really quickly. But so uh, basically for things that uh, I look at frequently or I have a lot of users looking at, um, like rollups can make it really fast. But even if I have things which are less frequent and I just kind of want to do a SQL query that grinds through a lot of the data, I can use, uh, just rely on Citus query parallelism to grind through millions of rows per second. Wow. I love the demos that you put together. Um, all right, so when we were, we were getting ready today and you told me you were gonna do demo, obviously I was like, yes, let's do this. But I also asked you um, for some real world examples. Like it's great to see a demo of what's possible, but sometimes it's kind of validating to see, well, are, is this really being done by anybody today? And, and are, how are people using Postgres with Citus um, to manage time series data today and, and PG Partman too, in some cases. Um, so you gave me a couple of examples. Um, if you're done, I'll steal the screen back. Sure. Right, can I do yeah. that? Okay, cool, let me do that. Um, do, do, do. All right, I think I've got it back. Can you, can you see my mixed rank screen? Yes. Okay, so this was one of the examples that, that you highlighted to me. Um, do you remember what you said? <laughs> Can you just say exactly what you said again? <laughs> so yeah, mixed rank is one of our earliest uh, users. Uh, like actually for many years they've been using Citus and since then their cluster has st steadily grown and grown and grown. Um, I like mixed rank is a kind of uh, search engine for, uh, for kind of sales and marketing and it, it's kind of a tool to help you sell more by having as much information as possible about um, things going on in the internet, essentially. Like uh, it tracks ad campaigns, for example, but not just your ad campaigns, everyone's ad campaigns. So they generate enormous amounts of actually time series data. And they currently have around 1.6 petabytes of data in their uh, Citus cluster spread over 20 nodes. And uh, they pr actually process even more data than that, about three petabytes of data a month. Um, and that's, that's pretty amazing. Like I, I recently shared this in a sort of distributed systems specialist group and they were like, wait, 1.6 petabyte in like a SQL database. That's, you know, you had never, you did not think that was possible, but, um, it's, it, it is what they're doing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really impressive that they can do that at that time series data at that scale. And then there was another one that you wanted to highlight as well, and that was Microsoft. So what I did was I grabbed a screenshot. Um, so this screenshot is, is taken from YouTube, and it's of a principal engineer, Min Wei of Microsoft, and he gave a talk just two months ago in September at Postgres Open Silicon Valley. Um, and it was all about how he's using Postgres and Citus um, in order to manage this really demanding um, analytics use case. So I thought it would be good for you to give a quick summary of why you think this is interesting. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a pretty cool use case. So it's basically, uh, wind there's a lot of Windows computers in the world and they report some tel telemetry data back to Microsoft. And these are things like, well, when you click uh, the start button, how, how much time does it take for uh, the start menu to actually appear? And uh, this is important data for Microsoft because then they can uh, see like, hey, if, if, if users are running particular software, is that the reason, maybe users with particular software are see, seeing a slowdown or users that have received a particular update. 
uh, and it also reports like failures and, and, and crashes and bugs. And um, like th this cluster uh, processes around three terabytes of data per day. And then there is an in internal dashboard that makes this, uh, visualizes this for internal teams. But basically at nine in the morning, tons of teams actually look at this data. So it needs to be able to handle a lot of concurrent queries. And of course, with, with sub-second latency, because people don't want to wait for 40 seconds for their page to load, they will, they will leave and think it doesn't work. Um, and so 95% of his queries are in four-second latency, and he does that with a, a cluster that I, at the time was 10 nodes with 700 cores. Uh, I believe since then he's expanded it to a 30-node cluster with uh, many more cores. Um, and uh, yeah. And for four terabytes of memory at the time? Yes, yes. Though he actually has a, way more data than that. And uh, he also uses Citus plus partitioning. So basically all his shards are also partitioned like we did, saw in the example here. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Well, um, we are at the top of the hour. So I want to thank everybody for their time and for joining us today. Um, I also put the URL on the screen right now for our public Slack. So I know a lot of other companies have a lot of technical Q&A discussions on Stack Overflow, but interestingly, there are people from, from our community more and more have been joining our public Slack. There's some pretty good discussions among both users and um, developers about Citus. So you could, you could join there if you have questions. And um, I put Marco's and my Twitter handles on here as well as Citus's. So thank you very much, Marco. Really, really appreciated this. Thanks especially for the demo. Yeah, and uh, thanks for the interview. It was, it was nice. Cool. All right. Ciao.